Hello Internet, I am the Hero of Julios once again with another episode of the Salt Marsh Vlog. In this week's episode, we continue deeper into the hallways below the Abbey, and I actually, you know, drew out with dry erase marker all the different twists and turns, and fortunately, thanks to the medallion they found, they were able to avoid all the undead encounters. Uh, they still had to fight the Jade Statue, they still had to fight a giant crystal minotaur, and they still had to, um fight the iron statues but the undead weren't a problem uh, actually there was this one part where evander rogue uh he snuck off from the rest of the party because he was just going one way the rest of the party was going the other way and evander ended up in the room with the crystal minotaur and a few undead and he obviously thanks to the medallion the undead ignored him but as soon as he touched the crystal minotaur it was go time and he, he went away from the Minotaur. The Minotaur chased after him. I made the mistake of using a large mini base for the Minotaur instead of a, uh, sorry, a huge base for the Minotaur instead of a large one. So it looked like he was bigger than the hallway. That was a mistake on my part as the DM. Uh, but it did lead to a cool visual moment where as he's going into the hallway to avoid the giant hulking beast chasing after him, he felt he was safe, he took a few steps back, and then he heard the sound of crystal shattering as it broke pieces of itself off in order to chase after him, which I thought looked really cool. I, I even went as far as to take some HP off of the beast because it it's my fault that he was bigger than he should have been. So... I took a, a bit of HP off just to symbolize the damage done as he burrowed through the hallways. But it was really cool because Evander has a Cloak of the Mountain back, uh, which allows him to cast Dimension Door. So as he runs away from the monster, he turns down a hallway and then bamfs back into the room where the Minotaur once was. So not knowing that he was in there, it continues to travel its way through the hallway and then eventually fights the rest of the party instead. Although I will say by the end by the end of the fight, I think the monster maybe had like 40 HP left. Um, that was when Evander finally caught up and helped finish it off. So uh, the party did all fight it together. Uh, <laughs> I should probably rewind a bit and go back to uh, when I last left off in the last session, uh, the druid in the party, who very much loves loot, very much loves gold, treasure, anytime something shiny, he calls dibs before the rest of the party can even say anything. Uh, this doesn't result in him getting what he wants, because I'm not a monster. Just because someone calls dibs doesn't mean the rest of the party is screwed. That, that would just be mean. Uh, he does usually get his hands on a decent amount of gold, and he'll get an occasional magic item. Although he, he does have a bad habit of just grabbing an item, not casting Identify, and then putting it on. Hence the crown from a few episodes back. But hey, what are you going to do? When, when someone wants to grab and just touch and do whatever they want to something, what am I supposed to do? Not put the, not like take the, am I supposed to remove the curse from the magic item that I had cursed originally? Just because one specific character grabbed it? Although, yeah, I guess I could do that. So rewinding back to the beginning of the session, I was controlling the druid's character. And the druid goes into the room that is actually a fake treasure chamber. He did not know that before the session ended, but hey, that's literally what it says in the book. It's a fake treasure chamber. His character goes up to the coins, and the rest of the party notices that when he grabs the coins, he realizes they are fake. You know what's not fake? The big jade vampiric statue that is going to bite him. So rewinding to the beginning of the session, I, the DM, am controlling the druid's character. Because in the last session he told me he wasn't going to be there. So because of that, I walked him into the treasure chamber just like he wanted. Not knowing, his character not knowing, I of course knew I'm the DM. His character not knowing that this was a fake treasure chamber. Fortunately for him, Avani was behind him, the other rogue, so she was able to at least keep an eye on him for his safety. He went in, grabbed a bunch of coins, and very quickly realized they were all made of wood. The jewels that he saw were actually just pieces of glass, and the only thing real in that room was the real danger. The giant vampiric jade statue that 
chomped into him. And he didn't have a lot of HP to begin with. He gave me his character sheet before he left for the session. Yeah, he was uh, he was looking pretty bad. Fortunately, uh, between having Dimension Door and a decent amount of movement, because he is a wood elf, uh, he was able to... Or high elf, but he's still an elf. He was able to get away from the monster, unfortunately leaving Ivani and Barak to fight it themselves. Once the statue was defeated, though, I told them, hey, the shattered remains of it are real jade. You guys can sell that. So they got something out of it. And Ivani, being an Inquisitor rogue, was able to find the secret door that enabled them to go to the real treasure chamber. A real treasure chamber that was filled with real gold and real jewels and real magic, which was wonderful. So I had the druid, still playing true to his character, run in there, grab as much gold as he could before the rest of the party could stop him, and he has a, def a decent chunk of money in his reserves for when his player comes back to the table. While all of this is going on, there's fighting in the basement, there's giant crystal statues, there's uh, illusionary walls that make a room appear like it's made out of steel, but in reality it's made out of stone. I still don't know what the point of that illusion was, but yeah, according to the Book of Salt Marsh, that was the illusion in the room. While this was all going on, there was a conversation going on right above them. You see... The acolyte of the cult was still alive. The party left him alive, mostly out of the uh, vote majority against what would have been two votes to kill, because this acolyte was an acolyte of Orcus, an absolute enemy of the Raven Queen. Felix, being a dad, obviously wanted to steer this child away from the darkness. I described the Acolyte in terms of him being about 17 years old as a human, so barely even a legal adult, has his whole life ahead of them, and Felix couldn't bring himself to just tell him to get lost or to kill him on the spot. He decided to at least give him a chance, a chance to explain himself, a chance to not be evil. To which I, on the, on the fly, I gotta create this backstory for a character who was supposed to die in one single hit. Uh, so I create this backstory that his parents pressured him to just, like, pick a religion, doesn't matter what. Uh, turns out the one religion he picked was Orcus. He didn't realize, he just picked it because it sounded like a cool name. Orcus turns out to be this death god, and it's too late, buddy, you're already in a death cult. You, there's no going back from that. So he gets whisked away to this abbey, and then the pirates attack, and his life's just been going on a downward spiral for the last several hours. And then this party shows up. And they give him a chance to get away. Whether he takes them up on that is yet to be determined, because this has created an interesting opportunity for in-character problems. By in-character problems, I mean specifically Ivani and Evander. These two siblings are both servants of the Raven Queen, and they both have very opposing opinions on what to do with this boy. Ivani believes that it would be a great sucker punch to Orcus to take one of his young acolytes and turn him into a servant of the Raven Queen. Or, you know, at least a worshipper or at least a renouncer of Orcus, what have you. It would be a great service to the Raven Queen. Evander, on the other hand, firmly believes that killing the kid on the spot for making this heinous choice is the correct answer. Unfortunately, Ivani's player was very tired and not really able to focus at the moment, so she she had a lot going on. So in character, she wasn't really able to make a lot of argument. I'm I was worried at first, but this did lead to an interesting opportunity, so I did let it roll. And let it roll I did. The dice tell the story, as I always say. So when the time came for the players to get back together and teleport back home to Saltmarsh, because now they have a helmet of teleportation, Evander was going to leave the kid behind. Ivani, if she knew that he was going to leave the kid behind, would decide to stay and try to do something with the kid. Evander 
would obviously not let his sister in on that plan. However, the argument is made that they've known each other for over a hundred years. They've never been apart canonically. That is something in their backstory. They have spent their entire lives being siblings together everywhere. It's hard to lie to someone who knows you that well. But it's also easy to lie to someone who knows you that well. Because if I do something completely out of character, my brother's going to realize it. But if I say like, hey, I'm going to go play D&D, &D. it's, you know, my usual weekly night at the store that I DM for, they're not going to question anything about it, even if I don't actually go to the store. So as a result, I have them roll. Evander's Deception versus Ivani's Insight. They both roll 17. Which is ironic, considering the age of the kid that is causing this sibling fight. But... I, as the DM, always rule meets it beats it. The tie goes to the attacker. It is Ivani's insight attacking against Evander's deception defending. Therefore, Ivani wins. Ivani knew what her brother was going to do and became an unwilling creature to the teleport spell, leaving her behind with the boy. Now, the Helm of Teleportation does give you three charges. Evander spent one charge taking a ballista found in the basement of this abbey and teleporting it to their ship. His second charge was to teleport the entire party back to the ship, and now, realizing his sister's not there, used his teleport to go back to the abbey. This means, at the start of the next session, these two players and their characters will be alone with this boy whose life hangs in the balance of what happens next. The drama is palpable, folks. I hope I used that word right. I do, I do remember talking to one of my players after it was over, and, you know, Evander's player expressed a little bit of worry that this in-character argument would become an in-player argument. But this is some of the things you have to learn both as a player and as a DM. If anything is ever concerning to you, talk it out with the rest of the players. Talk it out with the with your DM. Don't don't be afraid to outside of the table talk out what you plan to do. If you want to make some edgelord rogue who hates everyone in the world and despises everything around him and doesn't care whether he lives or dies, but by the end of the adventure, you want him to have this found family where everyone cares about him. Let the rest of the party know that. Let the rest of the players know that. That way, the bubbly wizard in the party is willing to talk to your edgy rogue and try to get him out of his shell. And then eventually the edgy rogue does come out of his shell. Just make sure you actually start having him come out of his shell. Or... If you want the big stupid brute in the party to become a well-educated individual, have the paladin maybe try actually teaching him how to talk with some eloquence. However you want to do it, it's okay to not just have the story unfold at the table. Talk, talk outside of the adventure and allow everyone to be aware that just because two characters are arguing, their players are still great friends. I'm not super worried about it because both Evander and Ivani's players have been my players for almost three years at this point. At least I think it's been three years. I'm always wondering, is it been two or three? Because I kind of forget the date. I think it's, what's, what's the year? It's 2023, and I started DMing at that store in 2021. So this would be one, two years. So this, this will be upcoming... No, no, we, we just had our anniversary. So, yes, this is our third year. This is, so I have been their DM for two years, and this is our third year together. So I'm perfectly confident that the two of them, outside of the game, will be able to reach a satisfying conclusion. Now, what happens in-game, however, I have absolutely no clue. Is Avani going to stop Evander? Is Evander going to convince Avani? Uh, is Felix going to feel bad when that kid doesn't show up? And the most important thing, what is the party going to do when they have to wait an entire day for their rogues to return to Saltmarsh when things are going down in Saltmarsh? If things are going down in Saltmarsh, I, I still haven't decided. A lot of the stuff I do is very 
improvisational. So we'll see what happens in the next episode. I hope you'll be there for it. But as always, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video. This is the Hero of Julios, exiting out.